Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Keelan Burke. I work with Retail Excellence, and I'm delighted to welcome you to today's webinar. Promises to be an action packed uh, one hour or so period. So, without further ado, I'd like to introduce today's uh, sponsor, Maeve Dwyer. She's the head of customer services, quality, and marketing with DPD. Uh, welcome, Maeve. Over to you. Thank you very much, Keelan, and I'm delighted to be here today. Um, what I'd like to do um, for the next few minutes is to take you on a journey and um, talk to you about um, DPD's journey over the course of um, 2020. Um, and it's certainly been a, a challenging one. Um, so um, if we move on to the next slide, I'm gonna give you some insights into uh, the, the growth that we've seen over the course of the year, um, really as, as a direct rep um, a result of COVID. So Black Friday week, 2019, um, we processed, um, almost 800,000 parcels through our hub in Athlone. And that was our busiest week ever in our history. We were established in Ireland in 1986. So that particular week, 2019, was the busiest that we had seen. Um, and along came COVID in, in March. Um, and by May um, of this year, we were processing exactly the same amount of parcels as we had dealt with um, the previous Black Friday week. So it was absolutely phenomenal growth. But of course, with that growth came um, huge challenges because we ourselves, much as everybody else, were dealing with the restrictions that have been put in place um, to protect ourselves in, uh, um, uh, in relation to COVID. We had new processes to implement with regard to um, proof of delivery capture where we were unable to hand over the handheld to the consumer any longer, we had to change that. And um, we were challenged with regard to um, resourcing up and also expanding facilities to, to deal with, with the volume. But thankfully we're, we're in a great place today and I'll talk to you about some of the changes that we've made. So um, this year we expect to deal with over a million parcels um, uh, post Black Friday. Um, so again, huge growth as a direct result of, of COVID. So if we move on to the next um, slide and I'll talk about um, some of the, the learnings that we've taken. Um, I suppose, when, when we were initially faced with these um, huge volumes at a time of year that we wouldn't have been anticipating them, and with all of the other challenges that COVID brought, um, we realised that we really needed to make quite significant changes to our um, network and our, our business in order to deal with this new world that we were now working on, or working in, I should say. I'm going to talk a little bit further on the next slide with regard to developments to our hub and to our depot network um, but also we invested over two and a half million in um, upgrades to our IT infrastructure. We have now um, a hybrid uh, approach to, to customer services and administrative support. So we have a small team still working in our customer services center in Athlone, but we have over 60% of our team um, working from home. And what that has done is it's allowed us great flexibility um, in terms of our, our um, ability to, to respond. And also we've very smart technology in place like um, chatbots and, and and automated um, messaging um, as well. So, so we've gone to, to quite significant lengths to, um, to, to develop and improve. And if we move on to the next slide, I'll just explain to you a little bit about the changes we made to our network and our, and our hub. So this year we invested over a million in um, expanding our, our hub in Athlone to allow us to deal with um, additional volumes. Um, normally, our hub operation uh, runs from about eight o'clock in the evening until 2 a.m. in the morning to process all of the parcels that come into us from all over the country and then back out again to, to the relevant delivery depots. We now start our hub sort at about 2 p.m. in the afternoon um, in order for us to be able to facilitate um, the additional uh, volumes. We have made significant um, changes to our network infrastructure as well. So we have um, expanded depots in Limerick, in Cork, in Clare, 
We've added two depots to the Dublin area. We have um, expanded the, the Meath depot and the Kildare depot. And all of this has meant that we have also recruited at this stage throughout the whole year, an additional about a thousand um, staff overall. So lots of changes within the DPD network, but all for the good. And if you'd like to move on to the next slide, I'll show you a couple of other interesting things that we've done. So in terms of, of training um, drivers, we have some new technology that um, allows us to use um, uh, virtual reality cameras to um, help them to understand how the processes work. Um, and I suppose it means that everyone is getting the same um, cohesive message about the different processes. Um, we had a significant campaign run across our social media platforms over the course of the last six months to, for driver recruitment. And if we just click on, and I'll show you another little interesting initiative, we actually have um, introduced a last mile piece in the Meath area, which involves deliveries on, um, on uh, bikes um, in, in the Drogheda area. And um, it's really just to add um, to the last mile element. And of course it has, um, it, it's green and it's clean too. So we, we're really trying to think outside um, the box to ensure that we're able to manage expectations. So we move to the next one then. So I have some um, suggestions for, for everybody um, and thoughts in relation to how um, you could help yourselves and your customers um, in order to streamline the whole journey um, between dispatch of, of, of your product to, to the end delivery. And a couple of key things that I'd recommend is, is firstly, make sure that you're um, asking your customer for their air code when they're um, ordering from you online. Make sure that you're getting their mobile number and make sure that you're, well, you will be getting their email, I presume, because you're, you'll be sending out order confirmations, but make sure to pass all of this information onto your carrier because it's immensely useful. Um, as, as, as from a cultural perspective, I think it's been really interesting over the last um, number of months to see how we as consumers have now started to use our air codes more and more. Um, we, the Irish people, and, and I can tell that from the, the data that we were receiving up until the end of last, Last year, we, we really weren't inclined to use our air codes at all, but now there's much more um, propensity uh, for people to use them. And it's so useful um, for our drivers in terms of getting to the end delivery point more quickly. Um, mobile and e email then allow us to um, communicate directly with the, with the parcel recipient um, through our email notifications and our SMSs. And a little bit more on that um, a little bit later. So in terms of setting your consumer's expectations, I thought this was a really good example of how um, one e-tailer, and that they're a retailer and e-tailer, so they're omni-channel, um, engage with, with their consumers with regard to a delay that they were experiencing. So this was an order that I um, had placed myself a couple of weeks ago and um, the, the uh, e-tailer was very, very busy at the time and it was taking them longer to fulfill than they would have previously. Um, so they sent out this lovely sorry email and it was fantastic because it set the expectations for me. I knew that there was going to be a delay and I, um, I then expected that the parcel was going to arrive a little, little later than anticipated. So a simple thing to do, but done very well. So this is um, an example of how we set expectations. So provided that we get the email and mobile number um, in the data from um, our shippers, then we'll send out messaging to the, the consumer, advising them of the delivery timeframe. So we can send them a, a notification on the day before delivery, telling them to expect it the following day. And then on the morning or the day of delivery, we'll also send a notification, giving them the one hour window for delivery. So again, it just sets the expectation. The consumer isn't um, sitting around waiting. They know when to expect expect their parcel and they're not contacting the, the shipper to find out more information either. Um, they have all of the detail that they need. So it's, it's, it's a very useful um, process. 
Um, another example of, of managing the expectations, um, for us this year, we set up a dedicated page on our website called it's dpd.ie forward slash peak. And the reason that we did this was we wanted to centralize all of the information around um, peak 2020, whether it was about service or trends or um, our holiday schedule, really trying to kind of centralize all of the information that, that somebody might need. And also what it allows is that our, our um, customers can actually put a link to that um, page in the communications that they send out to their customers as well. So it encourages um, their customers to visit our site. The reason that we decided to do it was that we set up a similar page um, uh, during the COVID period and it worked very well. It just gave us a central point to um, bring people to, to keep them up to speed with what was going on. Um, so, so quite a useful um, uh, landing page for, for people to, to, to come to. And then lastly, you know, this is, it's just all about keeping in touch. So simple things like making sure that the, your information is going out through your um, social media um, platforms, through um, email um, newsletters, um, and really through any mechanisms that, that you use on a regular basis to engage with, the, with your customers. It's absolutely, um, it's critical at this time of year. And if you can work with your carrier to have a, a hybrid partnered um, approach to those communications, it will give a much more um, streamlined experience for your consumer overall. And ultimately, if you're keeping in touch and if we're keeping in touch, then they're in the loop with what's going on and they're less likely to have to make contact with you to find out um, what the status of, of their delivery is. So look, that's, that's it from the, the DPD side of things. Um, it has been a very, very busy year for us. We've had to make um, a lot of changes, all very positive changes um, to our business and they've stood us in good stead. Um, we're so grateful for all of the business that we have with um, our retail excellent um, partners and we really will want to support you all in having a great peak um, 2020. Thanks, Maeve. That, that's great. And in fairness, it's, it's very impressive to, to see all the preparation that's gone into that. Um, you know, and uh, definitely a bit of reassurance. I think the key message you, you have there is, is communication and, and ensure to, to keep the communication levels up, uh, which is great. So thank you. Uh, so just moving on then, guys, um, our first speaker of the panel is Anik, as Connor Cochran of Social Media Elite with uh, influencer Aideen Kate. Uh, which is great. So I'd like to hand over to Connor now and introduce and let him take over. Brilliant. Thanks a lot, Keelan. Everyone. Hope you're having a good day. Uh, so I suppose a little bit about what I want to do to speak about today is kind of the key points in the lead up to Black Friday as a retailer, what you can be doing. I don't think there's anything like major changes to make, but there's a couple of key little things we can cover um, that might be beneficial that you'd be able to take away from today. Are you able to go through slides there, Keelan? Yeah. Um, so just a little bit of background on the company. We have Icon, Social Media Elite, and Viral Media. Icon is an influencer management company, and it also does uh, influencer marketing for businesses. So if a business is looking to use influencers, it'll source the relevant influencer for them. Uh, Social Media Elite, we're paid ad specialists. So we work with many businesses across the country. Um, and basically what we do there is, is we draw online sales or lead generation. And Viral Media is our creative agency. So that's like website, graphic design, video shoots, et cetera. Yeah. Next slide. Okay. Okay, this presentation has gone a little bit funny, the just back one, yeah. But um, formatting's a little bit off. But so I suppose some key points in the lead up to Black Friday. Um, so one of the things is organic social media. I suppose in previous talks, I will be saying that it's not really a key part of your strategy. And by organic, I mean not paid, your Facebook, Instagram. What I will be saying now is, is that actually use organic in this period of Black Friday, because the people who follow you on Facebook and Instagram, et cetera, and engage with you most often are probably your regular customers. And they're the ones who you need to use as your touch point with customers. So you need to use that channel. So put up regular posts on Facebook and Instagram on Black Friday and in the lead up Black Friday. Also using stories in time 
through Black Friday that period because Friday now is more than one day and it's actually spreading out um, the, the post and the content throughout that week. Um, next thing will be newsletters. Newsletters, um, it's not just, just doing one email blast with sales. It's about actually providing value and stuff throughout the year. But in the period around Black Friday, you're probably looking actually at how you utilize newsletters to your current database and make the most of it. So between Instagram, organic social media, and stories on social pages, there are things that aren't going to cost you money to get new customers, but are probably acquired customers or people who are aware of the brand that you can get your offers and promos straight out in front of them. So what's the next level to that is smart targeting. And that's where your advanced ads come in. That is something that I would have spoke about many times on, on presentation this before, how you look them new audiences, how you look at hitting them and engaging them. To be honest, if you haven't been doing that up to today, you're not going to get amazing results in the next two weeks. So that's why I'm saying to look at every kind of channel you can market with. However, what, whatever budget you are going to put into social ads, you need to wise. So you need to look at people and I would say when I talk about audiences, we pick some stuff from your website. You'll be able to target people who've been on your website, you know, your custom audience of your customers. That's smart targeting. It's people who's already aware of your brand. To think about on Black Friday week that you're going to put an ad in front of somebody who's never heard of your brand before and get sales. Even if your offer is the best offer in the world, don't waste your money. It's not going to work for you. So invest more in your people who've, who are aware of the brand, who've been on the site, who've engaged previously with you on social pages. Um, graphics over video. 90% of the year, I encourage you always to use video. Build awareness, educate on the brand, and people like to enjoy video on social pages. For this kind of two week period, it's actually graphics perform much better than video. So I would encourage you to use graphics over video. Make sure there's Mac 20% text in the graphics. Don't look, shove everything into that graphic saying 20% off, the best offer in Ireland, all the rest. Forget about that. You have your text above that, your description to use that. Get standout graphics that really make the brand stand out from the rest. And that might sometimes mean you need to be a little bit off brand with that. I suppose this year, the Green Friday and has been building momentum the last couple of years is really going to be strong this year. So although we're doing the language Black Friday, Green Friday is going to be huge this year. So make sure that's included in your graphics. Shop local, shop Irish. That needs to be a key part of your messaging as well, because we can see massive trends online that people are very much aware and searching for Irish brands, local brands, and want to support people. So in your graphics, make sure that Green Friday is there. In your content, then when you put it out there, don't just say buy it at 50% off. Who are you selling it to? And um, what is it that why they should buy it? So speak to the customer through the content. Don't just force the sale. Actually think about the tone of your language and you're using the messaging in the piece of content. And um, I suppose some little tools that I would, if people are, you haven't got in-house graphic designers or video editors, I would be saying tools to look at would be Canva for graphic design. Very easy to create graphics uh, in-house yourself by anyone. Crello, great for motion graphics. So although I say video isn't probably the way to use over this two week period, I would encourage like the likes of motion graphics and a tool like Crello is very easy to use. Um, iMovie, uh, excellent for video editing uh, and anyone can use it themselves. Uh, next slide there, yep. Yeah. And the slides are just not formatted right. So I suppose, when you go to Black Friday, which is going to happen over the next two weeks, how is a lot of what you've learned in that period to benefit you up to Christmas and right up to the new year? And I think that the one thing is, is your newsletter audience should have increased significantly. So what are you going to do in December? Are you going to send a newsletter every week? Are you going to send it twice a month? But be consistent. So think about that now. How are we going to get that new, new audience? Because you could have 100, you could have 1,000 new customers there in that audience. Um, Social posts. So again, back to your organic posts. Plan them out. So from now till December, or till the end of December, when are you posting? How often are you posting? The planning and scheduling of this is absolutely key for success. Because going up to the 22nd, 23rd December, and it's finishing. No one's thought about well, what's happening for Stephen's Day, the 27th, the 28th, which are big shopping days normally in store, and um, they still will be. But obviously, online is going bigger than ever. Um, in that period. So not just about Black Friday, we're thinking beyond that. And to be really successful, then plan out that content right the way through, through that Christmas period until the new year. 
Um, you should have plenty of new audiences for social target. Your website visitors should have been hitting all time highs. Um, your social page should have been getting all time traffic. So you should have so many new people to make custom audiences. So on the back end in the business manager, you should be able to make custom audience of all the people and then run relevant ads to them people. God, so these are maybe from John Blade or whatever. Didn't got distracted and retargeting them. Um, learning from customer behavior over Black Friday, what are the gifts that's working? How do you, is it both working for you? How do you learn from that and package that into the crisp market? Um, if you're going to do a Stevens Day sale, what can you learn from Black Friday to package a really good Stevens Day sale? Um, website learnings. All the traffic you want in the world to the website, but Website isn't right and there's holes all over. It's like pouring water into a book of holes and it's just going to fall straight out. But there's a lot you can learn from your website in that period. Over the next two weeks, it's going to be very hard to make reactive changes. But there's a lot you can learn about what's working on your site very well and where you can stick in changes for Black Friday, for Christmas, sale time after Christmas, and into January. Next thing. I suppose here's just a couple of examples from retailers we're working in October. I suppose this is more on a paid level and what they're achieving. And I like to always introduce this in presentations so we can really get a feel for what they can really achieve online themselves. So the first one is a client who's been trading very well online for the last two years, um, and they've, they've been doing extremely well, whereas the one below that actually only really started back since COVID. But you can still see the exceptional results both are achieving. These are just on Facebook and Instagram ads. Uh, the next slide there. So the next slide is a large retailer, okay, much bigger budget. So you can see that 42% of their website sales were coming from social media. They're very well trusted. Brand. So you can kind of get an idea of what is achievable for brands come. Um, am I still on? Just one foot, one minute there, guys. We'll just get Connor back on. Can you hear me now? Yeah, can hear you, Connor. Yeah. Okay, yeah sorry, yeah. Sorry, I think it's dropping for a second. Um, okay, so the first um, image there is someone who's a large retail, and you can see the it's been around and nearly around half a million. And the second one is an e commerce client, and the second one is incredible. These clients did run kind of sale discount through October, so that qualifies results. But I want to give an example of client A, which were small, and client B's, which were larger retailers. So a lot of people on this call would be able to relate to one or the other. Uh, the next slide. So now we have Aideen here. So Aideen's here with me. So I'm just going to bring her on. I don't think the camera's uh, working, but she's here anyways. So just to give you a little bit of um, introduction on influencers um, so influencers obviously are extremely any brand to be working with <clears throat> and i think like one of the talks i did back in april i would have been brands to actually start looking at how they could use influencers in april and COVID because people spend so much time on social media and that still is the case today it's mad amounts of time on social media and obviously with online sites so when you are looking for an influencer there are some key points that you should be looking for in terms of their like follower ratio, uh, seeing screenshots of their stats, having a clear plan how to utilize that influencer, and um, guidelines and timelines on, on making sure content is agreed. Um, and I suppose in icon management, our sister company, this is what we really specialize in, is really kind of coming up with excellent influencer campaigns. So I'm gonna talk a little bit here with Aideen in terms of from the influencer point of view, and when a brand is looking at an influencer, what they should be considering. So if we just go on to the next slide. Um, so just again to give you a little introduction to Aideen Cage, she's a beauty influencer, one of the leading ones in Ireland, 144,000 followers, weekly impressions, 3 million. And before I'd even say anything, ask Aideen anything, I'd be saying, if you're a brand and you're looking to work with an influencer and you're looking to spend money, like with stats like that or with any influencer, if you get an influencer with the right audience, you will see incredible results. So the big question I often get asked is how you pick an influencer and what one you should pick. So I think maybe if we got Aileen to start with actually what makes her want to work with a brand from the other side. So brands can be aware of 
what influencers are looking for uh, when they're picking a brand? Yeah, so I think when I'm looking for a brand that I want to work with, I have to make sure that it works for what my audience is into. It has to be what I like as well. So I would never just, you know, take a job for something for the sake of it. If it's not something that I am necessarily uh, interested in. Um, I think as well, like, it's important to just make sure that it's a product that I've used, I trust, I know it's going to be good. Yeah, I think that's really important because it has to be authentic. There's no yeah. point aiding going and posting about a brand that just doesn't work and that's where if you look at the top influencers in the country they a brand will reach out to them but often they'll turn down more deals than they than they accept and that's because they if it's just not right for them they won't do it so if you have an influencer that does want to work with you on that level you can be sure that they really feel like it fits their brand and when you're researching the influencer you should really make sure that does can i see my brand slotting in with their their content on their feed and um, and that kind of brings you on to content and briefs. The big thing that I find when I chat to retailers is, is that what content we should we get the influencer to do? What briefs should they create? And I suppose the thing that they often forget is they very rarely actually speak to the influencer and say, well, what do you think we should do? Yeah, I think that's really important as well because like me personally, I know my audience more than anyone else will because I'm interacting with these people every single day. So for example, if a brand came to me and they're like, oh, we want you to do a static post on this, I could turn around and say, well, you know what? Reels have been working amazing for me lately. I'm getting way more traction on them. The views are super high. So I think this would be more beneficial for me and for your brand. So I think listening to the influencer is really important. Yeah, that's really good because often we just think like, oh, can I just get you to do an Instagram story and a post? And actually, maybe your story views just aren't doing that well at that time. Or maybe your feed posts aren't doing that well. Whereas Aideen said, like Reels or IGTVs could be doing excellent for you. So it's important to have an open discussion with the influencer, discussing the content and the brief. Um, I suppose the next thing is, is like, how many posts should a campaign be? This is the sort of stuff that I often find um, I get asked, but maybe you want to kind of see for yourself, what would you think? Yeah, I think it's definitely worthwhile having like multiple posts, whether that's like static posts, stories, IGTV. I think the more you have, the better it is. You're getting your product seen a lot more throughout social media. Um, and yeah, I just don't think one post on its own is probably enough to necessarily like push whatever it is you're trying to promote enough. Yeah. Um, so I think it's important to have a few. Yeah, definitely. Because like sometimes brands will go and they'll work with an influencer and just look for one post and they'll measure the results just on that post. And like, that's not a campaign. That's not yeah. an influencer campaign. It doesn't just, just one post on a feed doesn't just change your brand that all their followers now buy that. And that's where going back to Aiden's point to start that it fits into your page. Absolutely, yeah. That you're talking about it regularly so that the, uh, there's a genuine connection with the brand, the followers and the influencer all connected. Yeah. And I think as well, like organic, talking about the products is like so important so for example if it's like you know a new lipstick you're talking about like I think just organic mentions even before the um actual like campaign goes live is really good as well because you're introducing that product to your audience without saying too much and then as the um campaign begins then you can really like dive into whatever you're promoting yeah and like you will see with influencers like let's say aiding might be predominantly beauty but she'll work with brands across lifestyle fitness and um, a range of areas and the reason why that's so relevant is, is because you'll find that an influencer like Aidy, your demographic is of a certain age, yeah. locality, let's say Irish yeah. predominantly. So you're like, okay, if I have a product and female oriented, mm -hmm. so if it's female oriented, it's beauty, fashion, lifestyle, and I want to hit an Irish market, fitness, you're slot right into my category. And that's how the brand has to look at it. Say, does, does that influencer tick a couple of these boxes? Um, and that kind of brings us on to cost then like obviously the more posts you look for the more it costs and um, one thing I'd always say is that the influencers have to invest a lot of time into this content uh, that they create but also there's a serious value with it like where else are you going to get your brand in front of 144,000 people or an impressions of 3 million people in a week um, with an audience that relevant and that trusted from an influencer point of view um, I suppose like from your point of view Aideen work-wise when you work with a brand what is it take long yeah like for example if I'm doing a makeup look it would take me four hours and then you know you have to do the work you have to do your editing all that so it can really take a lot of time so I do think the cost is 
a lot of the time worth the amount of work that goes into it. Yeah, and it obviously has to give a significant return to the uh, yeah. business and retailer. And that's why you can't just look at it and say, well, are we just paying that just for one post? No, actually, you're paying that for more than a post because you want stories, you want a lot more because you're buying into that influencer and in turn the influencer is buying into your brand and going to get your followers to buy into the brand. And um, I suppose the next thing is a lot of people often ask the difference between affiliates, paid promotion ambassador. So kind of give you a brief overview. Affiliates is probably something that works on a micro influencer level, a smaller influencer level where you'll give them like a link or a code and you'll then pay them commission based on what return they get. Paid promotion is a specific campaign or promotion that you're paying for like a set amount of posts. And an ambassador is a longer contract. So you might have an influencer tied in for three months on a set fee. Um, and I think there's benefits to each one. I suppose from an influencer point of view, what do you think works best for a brand and what you see in return? So I think I like being a brand ambassador is probably the best because you know you're going to get your organic mentions um of the products that you're promoting um because it's something that you're using all the time and a lot of the time you're, you'll be like on a monthly um like retain retainer or whatever that is and um, affiliates also work really well like for example I did a swipe up link on my Instagram story for a brand the other week and it made a very decent like return for that brand from just that one link um, and then of course paid promotion like it, it, it is what it is and um, everyone kind of knows what the paid promotion is but it, I do think it's all beneficial but I would definitely say an ambassador role is probably the best because you know you're really like locking that person into your brand and they're going to be associated with your brand and that's what people will yeah. know you from. And it's probably hard to commit to an ambassador straight out trying an influencer for the first mm -hmm. time so you might actually have to do like a paid promo and if it's very successful yeah. then look at negotiating an ambassador exactly, program yeah. because like it's in everyone's interest to do an ambassador program like the business wants that influencer tied to them and it's not jumping to competitors and an influencer doesn't want to be jumping between brand and brand they want to be working with the same brands consistently in the long term as well and um, i suppose some things to take away from what i would say about influencers is, is that there's huge value in using them and um, they're trusted with their audience. Um, like I think even the other day, Aideen, you said about a post you did and how the business wrote to you, the impact they had for them. Yeah, it was just a small business that I had shared on my Instagram story. They had just gifted me one thing and I got a message then a few days later to just say, wow, like they couldn't believe the amount of business that I had brought them in from just those one or two stories. So it really does make a massive impact. Yeah, and I think like that's where I would say is like Aideen's obviously one of the leading ones in Ireland, but if there's brands even on a smaller local level, there's there's micro influencers. You might have someone with 5,000 followers in a town and they could have a serious impact within that locality because it could be a very local following. So the same thing applies to the person with 5,000 followers as it does with 500,000 followers. You're still looking for the same sort of um, connection between the brand and, and yourself. Um, so basically to round off on, on influencers, I think using um, them is, is excellent. And I think part of your strategy should be absolutely essential influencers into Christmas, into the new year. And if anyone has any questions on influencers in particular, icon management, that's what we specialize in. And if anyone has any interest in, in working with someone like Aiden Cage, you can reach out to us and we can help uh, liaise with that. We can add some more questions at the end as well. That's great, Connor. Thank, thanks for that. And thanks, Aideen. Great to have you with us as well. Appreciate it. Um, so to introduce our next speaker is Anik Dennehy. She's the Digital Marketing and Growth Executive with Studio 49. Uh, definitely uh, a lady who um, has a wealth of knowledge in email marketing um, that has added a lot. So over to you, Anik. Hi, thanks, Macaulay. Um, yes, so uh, like you had said, um, I'm the Digital Marketing and Growth Executive at Studio 49 um, and a large portion of my time nowadays um, is dedicated to supporting our clients with email marketing. Um, so today I'm just going to bring you quickly through um, just some key aspects that we suggest that every business kind of has in place in regards to email marketing. Um, and it's just kind of six quick, easy steps. But before I jump into that, um, I just want to talk quickly about the importance of email, as I think it's often an aspect of marketing that's overlooked. Um, so the Wolfgang 2020 KPI report that was released earlier this year had some interesting stats. Um, they found that email tends to, well, it can outperform social in both driving um, traffic to your website and revenue generated. So on average, about 9% of website traffic comes from email and 7% of revenue. 
Um, so what I like to do is just ask clients, with these figures in mind, do you think that your own brand um, uses email to the same extent and puts the same effort and the same budget into email that you would into social media? Um, I think over the years, there's been a lot of talk, you know, that email marketing is, is dead or it's a thing of the past. Um, but I really believe that if you increase your performance on a channel like email marketing, it can become one of the most important ones for your e-commerce business. Um, so now I'm just going to quickly show you these um, six steps. Um, so firstly, just to start with the basics, um, half the battle that a lot of our customers um, and clients face is that they are on the wrong email platform. They can be on these difficult, you know, hard to use email platforms that don't have the functionality that they need. Um, there's a number of platforms out there um, that are, you know, super user friendly. Um, and the majority of these will come with a free trial so that you can actually, you know, try before you buy and see if it's a platform that you want to commit to. Um, a few questions, I suppose, that I've uh, laid out here, questions you should ask yourself before that you choose an email platform would be things like, does it have a drag and drop email builder so that you can, you know, get to building yourself without necessarily including a graphic designer? Um, does it have clear reporting? Um, is there good customer support? I think that one is essential because often, you know, when you're dealing with email marketing, especially if it's new to your um, business or new to your marketing team, you might have a question and that question specifically isn't necessarily covered in one of their maybe how-to guides. Um, so by having, you know, maybe a chat facility with customer support, that can really help. Um, does it integrate well with your e-commerce platform? Um, so, you know, a lot of um, a lot of the email platforms out there nowadays will integrate like really well with Shopify, um, but they might be slightly more difficult with maybe a Magento platform. Um, so it's just good to know these things before you, you commit to a platform. Um, and finally, I suppose, is there room to grow? So sometimes, you know, small businesses can start out on an email platform and it's perfect for them. It works. You know, they can send their, you know, monthly newsletter. They can send their monthly maybe promotional email. But then as they grow, they need more functionality. And this smaller email platform doesn't have everything that it needs to maybe send out, you know, automated emails or to have the pop up that they want to collect um, email subscriptions. So I would just, you know, make sure you think quite strategically about how you want um, email marketing to go for you before you commit to a, an email marketing platform. Um, next, I think the step, next step would be to um, start collecting email addresses. Um, so building your subscriber list is, is super important. Um, and there's loads of different ways you can do this nowadays. You can have, you know, sign up boxes on your website, in the footer or on your homepage. Um, you can have, you know, an opt in tick box at your checkout facility on your website so that, you know, when someone's filling in their contact details and um, there'll be their name, then their email address. And there can be a tick box to say, yes, I want to receive email marketing. And that's just a super easy way to collect it. Um, there is also obviously like pop up boxes and um, slide in boxes. These can be um, set up to either come on you after a certain amount of time. So maybe like 20 seconds on the website or on the homepage. And um, they can pop up after a certain percentage of the website is scrolled. So if they scroll maybe 50% of the page, then it pops up. Because sometimes I've seen websites where it comes up immediately. And the first thing that people do is just click out because it's in their way of you know, trying to find what they want on the site. So those things um, are important. Um, there's, you know, obviously you can physically collect email addresses in store. So um, what we see nowadays is a lot of people using tablets in store um, to just opt into the subscription list or, you know, integrating with their EPOS system. So, you know, when they're checking out um, you can get, you know, your receipt email to you, you can opt in that way. And um, obviously GDPR wise, you need to make sure all that's in line, but you know, it's another option for you. Um, one aspect I suppose to just talk on is, um, incentivization is used super commonly with email subscriptions. So people, uh, businesses will offer maybe 10% discount um, or a free shipping code or um, to kind of get people on board in exchange for their email address because it's, it's a good long-term invest in, investment to maybe offer like a small incentive and then get that email address back so that you have um, a channel directly to that customer, you know, going forward. But one way that we used with a client recently um, to incentivize was we entered every time a person subscribed, they were entered into um, a draw with a chance to win a prize. Um, and then once a month, this business um, offered, you know, picked out a winner for the, the prize each month. 
So they weren't necessarily giving, giving a discount code to every single customer, but every single customer was given the opportunity to win that prize and then one person won every month. So it was just a slightly cheaper version of offering an incentive on um, signups. Um, next, I look at um, segmenting your audience. So once you've started building your subscriber list, it's really important to start this process of segmentation. So I suppose quickly just to describe, um, segmentation means like grouping your subscribers um, based on their similarities. Um, so one subscriber can be in multiple segments um, based on you know, different attributes that they have. So this could be say demographic information, which could be you know, their age or their gender, um, their location, their date of birth, those sort of things. Um, you can also segment based on past purchase data, which could be, you know, aspects such as their average order value. So you could group people who have a high average order value together and then send them emails that are, you know, of a slightly higher budget. Um, you, can, you can segment based on behavioral information. So this could be maybe past pages viewed. Um, you can also segment based on technology aspects. So maybe the device that that um, person has used or the browser that they used, because this information can then be used for, um, for designing your emails, you know, optimizing your emails to, depending on the, the device or the browser. Um, with segmentation, I think I found in the past that um, people can find it like a super daunting task to, to try and segment their audiences. Um, but just having super um, simple segments in place, you know, maybe someone's age or someone's gender um, or pot potentially, you know, with someone's store location. So um, you can send out emails to a certain location that is relevant to their local store. So that, that person's getting very um, specific information that will, you know, be very relevant to them rather than sending out, you know, information about the Dublin store to all of Ireland and that's not relevant to everybody. Um, next, I would suggest setting up some basic segment or some basic automations. Um, so automations are emails that are automatically sent out based on how a user behaves with either your website or the emails that you previously sent them. So these automated emails are set up to be triggered to reach a customer when they are most likely to convert. Um, so this obviously leads to you know, increased customer lifetime value and an overall increased um, return on investment for email marketing. So the three automated series that we always recommend here at Studio 49 would be um, a welcome series, an abandoned cart series, and a win back series. So the welcome series kind of aims to build brand loyalty with new subscribers. The abandoned cart series aims to obviously increase those conversions. And the um, win back series is trying to um, improve customer retention because it's often more expensive to get a, um, a new person on board than it is to keep them. Um, and then the fifth step, we would say after you, after you have your automations up and running, I would look at planning your email campaigns. And the best way to do this, I suppose, similar to any marketing is to create a calendar. Um, so note down in this calendar, you know, your key dates, such as your national holidays, any upcoming sales, in-store events, um, what's happening with your social media campaigns. If you note all these down, these dates will then help you with your promotional emails accordingly. Um, with big sales in particular, it's great to have into anticipation emails um, as these help to create a sense of excitement in the build up to a sale day. Um, and a calendar, I suppose, will just keep you on track and keep you prepared for these kind of ups upcoming events rather than, you know, the week of, say, I, I won't say Green Friday now, but we say the week of Christmas, you know, um, sending out an email in a panic that not, isn't necessarily well thought out or, or strategized. So if you have these done in advance um, and then they can be triggered to send to send, um, you can schedule them to send, um, sorry, when, you know, the day before or, you know, at midnight of the day of the sale. And um, these can all be um, scheduled to send out when you feel they're most appropriate. Um, then finally, my last step would be to look at A-B testing and monitoring your KPIs. So with email, both automations and campaigns, um, there's so many aspects that can be A-B tested. You know, you could test subject lines, for example, um, to see if maybe the inclusion of something like an emoji would improve your open rate. And um, you can also test, um, you know, we'll call to action buttons to see maybe if a different color button or if a different action word could improve your click-through rate. And there's, you know, there's many other aspects you can, um, you can A-B test. Um, but also I suppose monitoring your KPIs is, is important for any aspect of marketing. Um, there's so many metrics you can track. You obviously have your open rate, unsubscribe rate, and um, click-through rate all of which will help you improve different areas. 
Um, but what it can be good to do is look up some email benchmarks for your industry specifically, and then see how you compare. Um, if you're doing better than these benchmarks, you know, happy days, keep doing what you're doing. Um, but if you're falling short, um, then it's a metric that you know you need to aim to improve. Um, so that's it really. These are kind of just the six basic steps with, with email marketing in general. Um, if any questions, just get in touch um, and I'd be happy to help. Thanks. That's great, Anique. Thank you for that. That was very insightful and we definitely welcome you back anytime instead of Jer. Um, <laughs> uh, so thank you. So next up, Martin Meany. He's ex-Wolfgang Digital, very knowledgeable guy. He's now the SEO performance specialist with Three Ireland and probably definitely a front runner for Movember this year. Um, so welcome, Martin. How are you doing, guys? You well? Uh, make sure you can hear me. Yep, we can hear you, Martin. Oh, excellent. Fire away. Um, and hopefully you can see me too. So hello. Um, so yeah, um, I am SEO performance specialist in Tree Ireland. So um, my deck, I'm not, I'm not a, a deck optimizer. I'm a search engine optimizer. So this does look like a bit of a mess. Um, but I'm going to try to talk through as much as this as I can. Um, a lot of this is going to be kind of mainly more general SEO advice. Um, maybe more aimed towards... Um, people who might be new to e-commerce to a certain extent, or maybe some bigger uh, e-commerce businesses that just have some fundamentals not, not quite set up right. Um, the reason being is that Black Friday, Green Friday, even to a certain extent Christmas, it's very, very close to be uh, hanging your hat on SEO. Like you should absolutely be doing the best you can um, and starting to get those good foundations in. But it's, it's really important to understand that SEO isn't a quick win strategy. Um, it takes time to bed in. It takes time to start seeing results. Um, but at the same time, there's no better time to start getting your ducks in a row than right now. Um, one thing I would say just from listening to Connor and Nick there is um, the one thing you can do this year is that if you are building Black Friday landing pages, um, when it's all over and done with, don't just kill them. Don't just put them away and forget about them. Um, you know, build a form on it, build a lead generation campaign from this year that feeds into next year. So, you know, don't let all your work from building uh, a landing page on uh, your website forward slash Black Friday um, go to waste. Um, like build on that page, uh, redirect that page to a new page. Um, and then next year, try and use the same URL structure again. And um, just because you get, you keep that authority building up over, over 12 months and you kind of start your lead gen campaign for next year and start it already this year. Um, so that's just one quick tip I will give. Um, the, the thing about SEO, I think that's really important to remember is that uh, it gets really overcomplicated. People hear the word algorithm and they run for the hills thinking I'll never understand this without a machine learning degree or something like that. Uh, it's really not like that. SEO is, uh, it's all about search engines. It's, it's things we do on a daily basis. We all search for stuff, um, whether it be in Google, in Bing, in YouTube, in your, in, in your own website uh, site search, that's a search engine. Um, so we're all using search on a daily basis. So don't overcomplicate things to yourself as well. Um, but I, I want to just walk through kind of a couple of simple things that you can kind of just to kind of adjust how you think about search engine optimization to make it a little bit more easy for yourself to kind of demystify it. Um, so the one thing I would say, it's, it's, it's often referred to as organic. Uh, it's not organic traffic. You do need to put a little bit of work into it because some companies like Tree have guys like me who optimize pages to make sure they rank. So if you're not doing that, you'll be outranked. Um, but the first step is to really understanding how customers search. So these are your customers. They're not your customers. They're other people's customers. They're soon to be your customers. Um, so there's a couple of steps you can kind of do to to kind of understand how your customer search. So the first thing to understand is that there's different stages of search. There's informational search, there's transactional search, and there's navigational search. So navigational search is where somebody's out in the street and they're like, where's a phone shop near me? So in order to kind of nail your navigational search, you need to have something set up called Google My Business, um, completely free platform to have set up. When I often talk about search engines, by the way, I often talk about Google because it's the dominant search engine, but don't neglect Bing where you can, um, because it's quite a big search engine too. Um, but if you're going to focus on one thing, focus on Google. Um, so Google My Business is where you can set up your local stores. If you've got more than one, you can set them all up. Um, if you only have one store, set that up as well. So if somebody's on the street looking for a beauty shop near me, um, you've got a greater chance to appear because you've told Google that you have a physical retail space. Um, 
really simple to set up it's completely free the one thing i will implore you to do is if you set it up look after it because there's nothing worse to a customer than saying where's the store near me they look it up online they find the opening hours and you're closed um so one big tip is if you're going to set it up please do set it up but look after it don't neglect it um so the other things you need to set up are google search console or bing webmaster tools these again two free tools um that lets you kind of see what people are searching before they find your website so this is a really valuable knowledge to have because you're starting to get into this thing of understanding how people search um, and once you understand how people or what people are searching you can kind of start looking at the terms and then start shaping your own web pages around that um, so those tools let you understand how your customer search then you've got google trends a completely free tool where you can type in terms um, like for example one i did recently was uh, Chris, a gift idea versus present idea. Um, gift idea is a very Americanized term that we all use in e-commerce land, but people searching actually use present ideas quite a lot in Ireland because we say the big present, we say all these kind of terms. So Google Trends lets you kind of see what Irishisms there are in the search in, in the search um, trends. And you can kind of see how you can tailor your content a little bit. And if you're clever with it, you can find out a way to undercut your competition by using a less competitive term. Um, then, yeah, so once you actually, the, the big one then as well is actually looking at Google search. So carry out some Google searches, like just type something into Google, see what gets thrown back. Um, there's lots of little hints that Google gives you. There's things like uh, people also ask, ask boxes. These are other terms that people use when they searched for what you just searched for. Um, and what you should be looking to do is answer people's questions. Google is nothing more than an answers engine. Um, you just need to know what questions people are finding and then give them the right answer. Um, so now that you understand how your customers are searching, you need to look at how search engines actually work themselves. So this is where things start to get a little bit more technical. You need to understand, can Google crawl your website? Does Google index your website? Um, so if you've launched a new website, which a lot of people have, or they might have revamped their website this year to deal with new online traffic increases, um, what your developers might have done is created that in a in public space, but put a little line of code in it that means tells Google stay away and don't crawl me. You'd be shocked how many websites don't take it out. I'm a big Formula One fan. And last year I actually was looking at the FIA website and they had a no index on it. This is a global organization um, who I'd imagine wanted to get traffic because I emailed them and gave out to them and they got rid of it. Um, so I've included some links in the deck as well here. Google Search Central is uh, it's a, it's a, a development resource, but they also have a, a professional resource bank. We can kind of read up on um, some tips and tricks and some things that Google, because Google is starting to reach out to, to people, professionals in the e-commerce industry more and more. The, there was a time where they said, don't optimize your website, we'll do all the, the searching. Um, and now they're actually very much kind of leaning on SEOs and e-commerce people to make better websites because it improves the whole internet experience. Um, then, uh, yeah, so some housekeeping then. Make sure you've got a site map. Make sure you've got your robots.txt file set up. Again, I'm saying all these things. There's links included in the deck. What I would say is what I'm, if you don't understand what I'm saying or it's not something you've heard of before, um, just give it a quick Google. Like use that Google search, the, the Google um, resources, Google Search Central, and kind of do learn, learn a little bit about it. Because like I said, SEO isn't organic. It does take a little bit of effort. So just familiarize yourself with some of these terms. Um, and some of them are very, very simple, really easy places to start out. Um, as a general rule, when you provide something like a site map, or a robots.txt file, what you're doing is you're making Google's life easier. Anything you can do to say to make Google's life easier, uh, they will look favorably on, mainly because if you think about it, if you're doing making it harder for them to process your data and your website, you're effectively costing them money because it's processing its server space. And um, so the more you can do to make their life easier, the better. Um, next up, then you need to optimize your content. So now you've kind of, you understand how people are searching. You're making sure Google can actually find your website. And um, so now it's time to actually optimize your content. The one thing I would say is um, don't optimize too much for Google, optimize for people. Um, Google will get there naturally. Google's algorithms are extremely advanced. We're not going to be able to decode them. No, very few people can. It's kind of like KFC recipe. Nobody knows how it works. No individual knows how it works. Um, so do kind of... Um, uh, optimize for people, how people search. So uh, what I mean by that is like, so Google doesn't use your page title and your meta description as a ranking factor. It doesn't really care about them as such. But if your page ranks and you don't have really compelling content in your page title and your meta description, people won't click. Even if you're in position one, they'll click two or three because 
they, they, they got more hooked. And um, we actually had an issue on Tree where I saw click through rates drop by 20% after migration on certain pages because there was a default meta description page that let's look in. Um, so it does make a massive, massive difference that if you've got a page ranking and you haven't optimized your content, you're, you're, you still might not get the click after doing all that work to get the really good content onto page one or position one at Google. Um, also make sure you're optimizing your images. Um, uh, make sure your image sizes are good. Like there's a free tool called Squoosh. Uh, it's a Google based tool where you can actually pop in an image. It'll show you kind of a split screen of before and after, and you can kind of dial down the quality where it looks visually the same, but the size could be up to 60, 70, 90% smaller. Um, also different content ranks differently. Like give, give consideration to, okay, you've got a website with loads of product pages. But maybe a landing page would address a customer question better. Like, like I said, there's different kinds of searches. There's that transactional search, which is going to be a product page where you're talking about price, you're talking about, um, where to buy all this kind of stuff but maybe there's a step before that where customers need to know a little bit more about the product before they purchase so do you need to have a landing page dedicated to your big selling product that answers a different kind of question to a purchase decision question um, and that kind of gives an idea then as well so you've got landing pages and product pages but then maybe a blog would be a good idea for you as well like it's by no means a new idea in seo that a blog that we love blogs because they give us such freedom to answer such a new range of questions but also in the time of covid if you've had to close your doors or had very restricted times where customers can come to your store you can use the blog to get your staff expertise out there and google loves expertise authority and trust this, these are some of their big big factors in seeing quality content so if you can take some of that energy and some of that knowledge from your from your shop floor and bring it into a blog and put it onto your website you're engaging with customers the way you used to engage with them in store while customers can't come to your store so it's a really really nice way to kind of speak to your customers and the way you used to it's also an internal engagement thing too um so then finally test and retest so the, the lines between search engine optimization people and user experience people is very blurred right now. Google is shifting very much towards a user experience based algorithm. Next year, we're expecting a big rollout where everything is going to be very, very much focused on user experience. So that's page loads, it's page stability, um, little things like that. So what I'd say is measure, measure your page quality. So there's, there's tools like um, measure.dev, I think it is. Uh, it's a free Google tool. There's also, if you're a little bit more technical, you can go into Lighthouse, which is in your dev tools within Chrome browser. Um, and this will give you scores on your pages. It'll score how, how fast the page loads, what the perceptible load is to people, because Google doesn't really care how fast your page can load. If it takes a big image 30 seconds to load, that's the perception. That's how long the page takes. To a user because it is like i said all down to user experience um and finally do kind of a really quick test to make sure everything on your website is healthy is find some of the content on your website be a product page a landing page even a blog post um take some of the content like take maybe even two sentences of content and copy and paste it into google and see is your page the one that comes up um, one thing we see a lot of happening is that you get big brands come in for launches and their marketing team will send over this is the copy we want you to use in your landing pages don't deviate from it um, this is where i always go to war with, with some, some external companies because uh, if you think about it like a, a big phone launch the company could be after sending the same copy deck to 20 different retailers um, and we're all just kind of blindly copying and pasting what they said onto the website and um, then Google comes along and sees every website using the exact same content so do try and tailor that content to yourself um, be brave push back against the, the big scary uh, vendors if they're not too happy and explain to them for SEO reasons and um, you want to make sure you've got original content but as well as that if you're not appearing then maybe you've got a technical issue with your site um, if you are appearing then great you're, you're obviously one of the first to market and you've got a great page um, so what I'd say is that was kind of a very much uh, a bit of a whistle stop tour of uh, SEO in 2020, moving into 2021. Um, like I said, it, there's a little link down at the bottom there, tree.ie forward slash Marty. Um, you'll find me on LinkedIn there. I'll be more than happy to kind of talk to any of this stuff and kind of send you over some links and stuff too. Thanks, Martin. That was really insightful as well. Fair play. Um, lots of food for thought there. Um, so appreciate that. Next up, we have Michelle Duffy Rudden. She's customer success advisor with Shopify. Uh, so welcome, Michelle. And over to you now when you're ready. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to run through five things that are relevant to Black Friday, Green Friday, this whole period, on into Christmas and on into the future. Um, so just to, 
to build really on what the other speakers have said. All of it makes so much sense. You're getting great information today. Um, and just not to think of any of these kind of spikes or events as isolated things. They should all be part of, of a big picture. So the first thing, if you just want to come on to the next slide there, the first thing is to show off that you're Irish. So how do you do that? Well, you could get a .ie domain. I see uh, a lot of Irish businesses without a .ie domain. And I know personally a few years ago, trying to buy one was quite difficult. You had to prove all sorts of documentation and it just became a, a kind of a thing people procrastinated on and didn't complete. And then a .com or some other extension did them fine. Um, and they had a, a website and everything is great, but I do think it's more important than ever to have that .ie just for that Irish branding because the customer sentiment to buy Irish at the moment is so strong and it just builds a little extra layer of trust. And also, I'd say that you don't necessarily have to move away from the .com that you're using or whatever you're using. You can point more than one domain to the same website. Um, also, the use of logos about Irish awards or associations you're a member of. So retail excellence, if you've got the guarantee, guaranteed Irish logo, if you've won any other awards or you're part of any other Irish association, having those logos on your homepage or at the footer of, of email newsletters, that kind of thing, it just reinforces that. And the customer at the moment is feeling very good about themselves when they buy Irish. So if you can tap into that emotion, um, it's definitely worth it the little bit of work it is to put those logos on your website. What makes buying Irish unique compared to just getting the cheapest thing or the fastest thing, uh, you can brag about those things in, in the content that you're putting out there. So on your website and also um, in marketing content, you can say things like, you know, that you've got faster shipping times. So, I mean, DPD have put in massive work there, as you heard at the beginning. And all of the carriers in Ireland at the moment are absolutely flat out. So while things are might be a little bit slower than they were pre-COVID, it's still faster than, than getting uh, international. So you can brag about the fact that it's less carbon miles as well. If it's if it's staying on the island and it's going to be with them in, in the next couple of working days, you can use things like that about how it's uh, less harmful to the environment. It's going to be in their hands quicker. And there's also not going to be customs fees. So sometimes people think they're getting a bargain on Black Friday and they buy it from an American website, for example. And because that's outside the EU, it could take weeks to get here. Um, if they are considering their carbon footprint, that's not the best way to get that product. And then they can be strung for customs. I think we all know somebody who's been strung for customs when they thought they were getting a bargain. So use those things to your advantage and show off that you're Irish and be very proud to be Irish because at the moment there's a, a sentiment out there in the consumer market that has never, never reached these levels of being proud to support local and Irish. Can I have the next slide? Thanks. So the next thing then is to make sure that you're marketing ASAP. So not to leave things till the night before an event like Black Friday, Green Friday, Cyber Monday, Christmas, and to make sure that you're being consistent. Now, as well as all the great things that we've heard from the other speakers about SEO and about social media, I just want to touch on a few extra layers that you may or may not already be doing. There's Facebook groups have taken off this year in a big, big way um, around Shop Local and Buying Irish. There's one in particular called Shop in Ireland, if you want to just look for that group on Facebook. And it is just a phenomenon at the moment. There's like the guts of 200,000 members. It's only popped up in the last couple of weeks. Um, and the stories that I'm hearing from Irish businesses about the amount of sales that they're getting from one post in there. It's just a hub of all things Irish. I've done plenty of shopping in it myself. Um, and even just to see, it, it's just really heartwarming as well, just to see the support that's in there from customers. So maybe consider things like taking the extra time to post yourself as the business owner, or you can go in there and post as the page in groups as well. Um, and just to tap into those extra channels. So you're probably already doing your posts and your stories and your ads, but just not to forget about Facebook groups because they're very powerful at the moment. Um, keep an eye on the hashtags on Twitter and Instagram because there are a lot of them that are national campaigns like um, buy Irish, think Irish, those kind of things, but there are also quite localized things. So maybe it's your county or maybe it's a particular region. 
And whether that's where you're located or you know that you have customers there or want to have customers there, just check out because there's a little variation on it all the time. Like here we have hashtag love Cavan. In other counties, then they might have, you know, shop Kildare or just check out what's happening in, in hashtags and make sure that you're including them. But don't copy and paste the same 30 hashtags into everything that you post because it just starts to look like spam to the algorithms. So just change it up a bit and use a few, but just don't spam it with exactly the same uh, massive list of them every time. And then LinkedIn stories. Um, I've heard some really surprising stories, ironically, about LinkedIn in general and how surprised people are at the amount of shopping that happens from LinkedIn. So yes, you're on there to post about your business's um, goings on, but actually it's become more social than it used to be. And at the end of the day, even all your contacts on LinkedIn are still consumers. So this time of year when everybody's in that gift buying mood and everybody is looking to buy Irish, it's another place to maybe just ramp up the networking and post about what it is that you sell. Um, and they also have stories now for that short form video content. So while that is a new feature on LinkedIn, people will be checking it out. So even people who ignore stories on Facebook or Instagram will go into LinkedIn stories for a nosy just to see what is it like. So show up. <laughs> um, and then to make sure that your some of your advertising is targeted locally. So if you have been running a campaign in your paid ads that's going out to all of Ireland, maybe just zone it in a bit because uh, you can tailor the copy and the content then to matter for a particular area. So you can be showing up to a particular county or town with language that, that appeals directly to them. Or if we come out, we're all in the same level five at the moment. If an area comes out of a level and another county is still, you know, has different restrictions, you can just make sure that your radius of your ads is showing up at really relevant stuff. So there's no point in saying call into us to a county that's not allowed to travel, that kind of thing. Just make sure that it's really relevant. Okay, then in terms of SEO, it's been very well covered already in depth. Um, just to mention that if your store is on Shopify, um, well, on any platform, make sure that there are keywords in your product descriptions and write your product descriptions as sentences and speak to the humans that you're trying to sell to and not to consider uh, your online customer as a robot or a screen. It's a real person. So speak to them the way that you would in person. Don't just use bullet point lists of the spec of a product. Um, and then to make content, content, content. So when you're trying to be found, um, use pages like about us pages, because if I come across your website and I like the look of the product and the price and the shipping and everything looks like it's going to be OK as a transaction, but I don't know who I'm buying from, I'll, I'll hesitate. And if I hesitate, I'm taking a step back instead of a step forward to a conversion. So the more that you use pages, you will be found by Google better, but you will also build trust with a customer who's, who's considering, they have it in the cart and they're considering, but they haven't actually turned into a purchase yet. So an About Us page is a very powerful place. If somebody is hesitant and just thinks, hold on a second, is this a scam website? Is this you know, going to take weeks to get to me? Who am I even buying from here? A little bit of storytelling, a little bit of background, and especially pictures of people makes such a difference when you're trying to do what you would as an offline retailer. You know, you'd make eye contact, you'd have a conversation, and you, you would be very proud of whether you've built your business up in the last week or over 100 years. Those stories matter to people. So use those About Us pages to tell the stories. And the same with blog posts. Um, you don't have to become a blogger overnight, but little articles like the how-to of how to use a product or, you know, this time of year, even gift wrapping tips or just something that's relevant to what people are going through. Um, it, it's something that you can share then on your social media. And when people come over and read it, it's a visit to your store. So, OK, they're not on a product page. They're not actually shopping, but they've come over to your, your website and you can remarket to them later based on what they read. So you know the people who read the how to make banana bread are people who will consider baking banana bread. So if you're selling tins or you know, cooking utensils, that's the ad to put in front of them. Um, and then videos, I would also say videos of behind the scenes. So 
not to clutter your website up with lots of heavy HD videos, but just when you can show off who the people are in the business and whether they're little funny things that happen behind the scenes or whether it's uh, tutorials on how to use the product, but that kind of content of seeing who is behind this business is so important to build that relationship. And then the meta titles and descriptions, as have been mentioned in the previous talk, um, that you could be ranking very well in Google, but I'm not clicking into you in my results because I don't know anything about you. So that title and description is really important. And on Shopify, it's an online store and preferences. And we have two boxes there where you just fill it in. But just please do check that that's filled in soon. So the next thing then is to have a discount strategy. So if you're going to take part in Black Friday, Green Friday, Cyber Monday, or any of the fl you know, flash sales that are happening this time of year, not to blindly go into it and just think, OK, this is something I have to take part in, number one, you don't have to. And if you are, that you don't necessarily have to go, we're having a big half price sale or we're practically giving stuff away. This is something that you are in control of. And there are lots of ways to do it that could be to your advantage. So it's been a tough year. You've had extra costs that you didn't have in other years and you've had a major hit to your sales no matter what way you've managed to get through 2020. So the last thing on anybody's mind is slashing prices and therefore profit margins and just trying to sail through and break even. So it could be a percentage off or it could be a fixed euro amount off and that could be on particular products. It doesn't have to be across your whole range. There are bundle deals that you could offer. And if you're on Shopify, we have an app store where they're like little plugins that, that give your store extra features. There are apps that will help you to create bundle deals. So if I add a particular three products to the cart, it'll automatically take off whatever amount of euro. But it will also prompt the customer that, you know, you've bought this shirt and this tie. Did you know if you throw in this cardigan, you know, you would be saving 30 euro off what they cost individually, that kind of thing. Um, and then buy one, get one free or buy a particular product and get a particular product at a reduced price. And the other thing then would be a free gift. And that could be a gift card of a future purchase. So it might be, you know, a way of making sure that you can retain them and that they'll come back in 2021 to spend their voucher. It could be something that's sitting around in a stock room right now because you couldn't move it earlier in the year. And now suddenly it's going to become a free gift because it could clear up valuable space that you need. Um, so just bear in mind what the cost price is of particular products to you and whether this is online or offline. It could be something that you know that you had a great margin on and it only costs you very little to, t to bring it in. And now they're just sitting there because you, you've had to close the door for so long. So suddenly it becomes an add value instead of a percentage off. So instead of trying to, you know, hurt your bottom line and take in less revenue, you're actually trying to give added value. If that's a surprise free gift, that goes down very, very well with customers where, you know, the price is, is as agreed and they pay. But when they receive it, there could be uh, a little surprise in there. I've had deliveries here with little packets of sweets or um, or a free gift from that uh, store or it could be samples it could be just something that just surprise and delight and go that little bit extra and that does keep people coming back so just not to be afraid of, of black friday and um, the other thing then would be to leverage the media attention that is on irish business this year so this time of year radio chat shows tv newspapers online everything is full of black friday black friday black friday but really it was trying to sell advertising space you know what are you doing that you want to shout about your black friday whereas this year i think there is just such an interest everywhere from local to regional up to national media about um supporting irish and the stories behind the businesses and the people behind the businesses who are hurting and the jobs that we're all trying to protect so jump on that when that bandwagon is there. Absolutely. It's sometimes a researcher will reach out to you because they come across your business or they know about you from some other way. And sometimes you have to go to them. So you don't necessarily have to hire a very expensive PR agency and there wouldn't be time to turn a big thing like that around right now anyway. But things like following the hashtags on Twitter and 
looking, following journalists, following researchers. So often at the end of a radio show, they'll say who produces the show. They're the ones to speak to, not the presenter. Uh, the same with TV, watch the credits and see who do I need to speak to here? Who are the researchers and producers of these shows? Follow them on Twitter. It's where all the journalists hang out. And there are things like hashtag journal request. You know, look that up and see what are they looking for. And even if it's not your product or your um, business that is the solution to what, what they're looking for, you probably know who is, though. So send them a contact of yours and say, oh, I think you should go and look at this and they'll remember that um favorite their tweets retweet them you know that kind of stuff as soon as you start engaging with them and showing up their notifications they now know that you exist um and you could get a lot of free publicity that way engage with the show's chat so a lot of tv and radio shows have a hashtag for the show so just take part you'll be seen and uh while all that free publicity is there this year more than ever i would say just engage with everything that you can and send them your story and don't uh, I know it can feel quite vulnerable when you put something together and you send it off and you may get rejections or you may just get completely ignored but I would say just send it off and see what happens because a mention like that on traditional media can be really really powerful and then in terms of what we call omni-channel where you're doing a bit of offline online lots of everything um, just make sure that you're joining the dots on and offline, that they're not separate things. Because what I've seen in, a lot in retail in 2020 is people who had uh, a good retail brick and mortar presence and online was just kind of in the background or perhaps even a threat um, to, to their physical presence. And now they've had to factor it in instead of their physical presence. I think what we're moving towards now is not a reverse back to the way things used to be, but rather that this is this is how it's going to be is a bit of everything moving forward. So even when retail opens again, I will still shop online through choice because it's more convenient. Um, I don't necessarily have to pack the kids up, find parking, all that jazz, wear a mask, queue outside. So it's just easier for me as a customer to, to shop online. So remember that people will still want to support your online business. So you can use things like the Facebook pixel to see who's been visiting your store and which parts of it and put relevant content and ads in front of them. You can get information from your POS. You can have QR codes that they could scan in store. And um, in the next slide, there's some links for you afterwards. And one of them is a free tool from Shopify where you can create a QR code. So just something that they scan with the camera and their phone while they're in store. You will have to incentivize that. Like, why would I, why would I scan that? Is it to get an exclusive discount or deal? Is it to enter a competition? Very much like the way that you would get um, email signups. But it just means that you're joining the dots now and you're turning your on offline customers into online visitors and vice versa. Um, you can encourage user generated content as well by maybe having some signage in the store that says, you know, if you post with a particular hashtag that again, you're gonna have to incentivize it a little bit but that kind of thing of it could be a little card that comes in their online delivery that when they open it, thanks them for their purchase or says, you know, if you're posting about this online, please use hashtag whatever. And then you can track that and you can engage with that and you can share them. And then it's not just you constantly spouting about yourself, but you're engaging because you're building a community. So just to make sure that those online and offline channels are working for each other instead of being in competition with each other. So there are the links. Uh, the IED or is, where it is the domain registry for IE domains. Um, if you don't have an online store yet, we have a 14 day free trial when you sign up and we have 24 seven support. And we're more than happy to take any of your questions or walk you through anything that you need to get you set up as quickly as possible. We have POS, whether you're casually just doing pop-ups and occasionally taking payments in person or have uh, multiple locations. We have solutions for every type. The QR code maker I mentioned, our help center is busting with documents on every single thing that you might get stuck on. And it's also where you reach out to us anytime for help. And we have online courses if you do have time in the next couple of weeks and are stuck on a particular topic and want to go a bit deeper on it. We have courses there on all sorts. Thanks so much.
Thanks, Michelle. That was great. Some great nuggets of advice there. Um, things you wouldn't necessarily think of, which is good. Uh, so appreciate that. Uh, so next up, we have Nick Butler, who is the owner of Ireland Website Design um, and is very knowledgeable in all this space. So welcome, Nick. Over to you. Hey, Keelan. Um, so let me just share my uh, webcam. I think you need to enable that, Keelan. Right. Okay. Keep going there, and I'll. I'll... There we go. Okay. Great. Um. So thanks, Keelan, uh, for the introduction. I I want to talk about how to increase sales in the run up to Christmas and what you can do um right now. So there's really four ways that you can use to increase uh, revenue from your online shop. That's uh to drive more traffic, which um the other panelists have talked about uh, in a lot of detail. There's also encourage and repeat sales from existing customers, um which is a lot of that is email marketing and Anique talked about that which was great. So there's two other ways to increase revenue from your online shop and that's what I'm going to talk about today. The first one is um, um, is improving your conversion rate or the percentage of people who buy who visit your store and the the last one is ha uh, increasing your average order value so if you can do those two things you can increase um your, your your revenue and and really what i would say to you is that like a conversion rate on an e-commerce store depending on the industry and the business type is anywhere between one percent and four percent that means that like there's a good percentage of people who are not actually going ahead and purchasing from your site after visiting. Um, so at least 95% of the people that are arriving are, are, are leaving again without buying. So if we can encourage those people uh, to purchase, um, you can you, you can easily increase revenue. So I feel like this is something that you can implement in your business now um, that will help actually turn the bottom line right now, rather than, you know, if you try to set up Google ads now or Facebook ads, there's approval process, there's getting your creative set up. It all takes time. Whereas um, some of my suggestions, you can probably start working on uh, right away. So um, some ideas to increase conversions. Well, first of all, we need to think about user intent um, and just back on what Michelle talked about. Um, so pe people are wanting to support local right now, family businesses. Um, so it's Christmas time. Um, we're all looking about, about buying gifts. Um, we're all concerned about delivery and whether stuff will turn up on time. So these are the types of things that are going through people's minds right now. And so um, I would suggest, you know, to, to on your, your website, make your unique selling points prominent about being local, about being a family business, about being Irish, about um, having good uh, d delivery service. Um, so... It, it, any marketing campaigns that you should be running, be it from social or email marketing or anything like that, right now, thinking about that user intent, I would be creating like a Christmas shop on your website or a gift section on your website. And that's where I'd be uh, funneling that traffic into right now um, because that's what people are looking for. And I'd also be thinking about who people are buying gifts for. So really to break down your Christmas uh, section on your website into gifts for him, for her, for boys, for girls, um, and also corporate gifts. So even, you know, if you're not a gift business, um, I'm sure a lot of your products can fall into um into the category of gifts so if you were to look at a lot of shoe shop retailers will sell like handbags scarves accessories socks and um, wallets that kind of thing and that can all fit very neatly in a, a christmas gift section um so think about your business and what you could put into a gift section and what what's a gift for him what's for her what's for for a boy or a girl or a corporate gift and and to do that and um, i'd also sort your products by popularity so when people are looking through your gift sections that they're seeing the most popular gifts first rather than last um, so that will increase your your conversion rate and then also something michelle talked about as well but bundling products for christmas right now so people might be more inclined to buy gift uh, packs or, or hampers uh, i was looking at um a, an independent uh retailer selling soaps online a couple of nights ago and from that uh, shop local facebook group as it, it, which michelle mentioned it's very good um and the problem was i could buy individual bars of soaps for like six euros but there wasn't like a hamper with a selection of soaps in it that i could give as a gift as a present right so what what can we what can we do to make our products um 
more suitable for gifting. And um, the other thing is creating uh, urgency and scarcity uh, when people come to the website. It, it, that's FOMO, fear of missing out. Um, and the likes of Sony, PlayStation, and Apple, and brands like that do that really good right now. There's not a PlayStation to be got in the country. And like, I mean, it's been five or six years since the last PlayStation came out. So these guys had plenty of time to make sure that they had enough supply of that product. I mean, they run up to Christmas. They purposely deliver slightly less than what the demand um, is for the product, which creates a buzz gets people rushing to buy it, gets people talking about it. Um, so, 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 so these companies do this on purpose. Now, you know, they, that's at a very big level, but you could do that on a small level too. So some things you can do on your website is show if your stock is running low or what your stock quantity is of a product. Um, so if I see there's an item I'm thinking of buying as a gift and I see that there's only one left in stock or two left in stock, I'm getting nervous about whether um, that's going to be still there if I come back again. So I might just go ahead and complete the purchase now rather than taking the chance. Um, and another thing that can really kind of push somebody along is um, a pop-up. You'll see it on, on some sites in the bottom left corner of the screen. It'll pop up and say, look, Mary or John just purchased uh, a particular item five minutes ago. Um, and that makes you think, well, hang on, this store is really busy. There's only two items left in stock. I, I need to get this purchase done now before I lose out on it. So uh, there's a plugin um, from a website called FOMO, F-O-M-O.com. You can go there, you can actually, and it, it supports all of the main shopping cart systems. And it, it puts that feature and other features on your website, which I think are really good um, for, for creating that urgency in the buying process. Um, live chat right now is really good. Um, and having your, your contact details very visible on the website. So look, we really just want people to come in, make the purchase and, you know, as efficiently as possible and you know you may not want to encourage too many support requests and stuff but you've also got to think about who's actually buying online right now so my dad rang me the other day and he wanted to know um if my sister would like a certain gift and i said no i think she's got one of them already he was on a website called groupon and i said well why don't you look at this gift on another website and he said well i haven't bought off those websites before i've only ever used groupon before and i don't trust using my credit card in lots of different places so there's this my dad can use a remote control he can barely use a computer so it just goes to show like there's these people who never bought online before who are coming online now and they feel nervous about making those purchases or using their credit card on websites that they're not sure of. So having the, you know, your phone number there, having a live chat that they can talk to somebody to help them through that process is, is really fundamental, I think, right now. And talking to some of the retailers that we work with, they're getting a lot more queries from customers right now about how to buy online and you know questions and you know trying to order over the phone and that type, kind of thing because they're not used to that online shopping. Um, so again, your website is converting somewhere between one and 4%. So as I said, you know, 95% plus of people are not actually completing a purchase at your website um, after they visited. So a lot of potential is being lost from visitors who don't buy. So there's a few things that you can do um, to, to try keep those people on the site and make them purchase. Um, so the first one is a, a, an exit pop-up. Um, so how an exit pop-up works is we don't like pop-ups, but as you move um, to head to the address bar or to click out of a tab on your browser, we can then create a pop-up. So we know the person's leaving your website now. So we create the pop-up at that point. And that is a last ditched effort to actually turn them into a sale. So it might be a good time to uh, offer a slight discount or an incentive or um, just give them some reason to buy from you, you know, maybe mentioning your USPs or something like that. Um, also retargeted ads. Um, so Facebook, Google ads, they all offer retargeting. Um, so it's a really easy pool of people to try to get back to your website again to sell to and abandon cart emails. So if they have started the checkout process and abandon during that process, which, you know, abandoned cart rates could be anywhere as high as 70, 80%. So you can have an email go out to them, encouraging them to come back and complete the purchase. We find um, about six hours after they've started that uh, process is a good time uh, to, to follow up. And then um, in terms of increasing your average order value, which is the other way you can increase revenue from your online uh, store, what you can look at is um, showing frequently 
bought together items. So a lot of fashion stores will do something called complete the look where you're looking at um, a particular top and then there's a matching um, bag or accessory that goes with that. Um, so, so showing those items will often get customers to buy more than one thing as they're checking out. Uh, you can also consider uh, upsells in the cart. Um, so when they add things to the cart, you can pop up and say, oh, people who've bought this item have also bought this in the past. Um, so that can help you get more sales. And there's a huge thing, which is when somebody buys off your website, they've given you their credit card, they've ma made the purchase, and they've gone all the way through and they get to this thank you page after completing it and they've become a customer and they've gone through that entire psychological process to go from just being a visitor to being somebody who is a customer, right? And they get to this, like often cases on retail stores, very unimpressive thank you pages, you know? And those thank you pages can be actually a good place to make more sales, believe it or not. So you can actually offer an incentive um, on that thank you page that look, you know, to, Thank you for purchasing from us today. Uh, here's some other items that you might be interested in adding to your order now um, and to get a slight discount or something like that um, it, it, as an incentive for them to make those purchases. Um, so you could also increase the threshold to free shipping. Um, so if you're finding that um, you, you know, your average order value is too low um, and your free shipping uh, rate maybe is too close to that, you can push the free shipping rate um, up a little bit higher so they'll add a bit more to their cart to get the free shipping and you can also um once they've gotten the free shipping you can offer further incentives for them to add more to their cart to buy more um, by offering like a free gift or something like that um, and a few mistakes um that retailers make at this time of year um which i'd like to kind of talk about because you know it, it, it's a critical time more than ever for you guys to make sales right now so um, not putting a cutoff time for Christmas deliveries. Um, so I, I wouldn't like to think that there's any retailer here going to be rushing around on Christmas Day trying to deliver uh, little Johnny's PlayStation. Um, so you need to put a date on your website that says every order up until this date will be delivered in time for Christmas. Any orders placed place beyond this date um, may not be uh, may not arrive in time. So um, and and then just just be aware that on that cutoff date. You're going to get a lot more orders um so so that that's important uh, also another mistake is uh, retailers not having enough hosting resources if they're self-hosting their own websites um and not communicating with their hosting providers that they're going to need more resources so as you are getting more traffic anyway because it's the christmas period and you drop online marketing in on top of that which is what you're probably going to do because you're on this webinar so you're clearly interested in marketing your website you're going to have a lot more volume of people looking at your website using it so you can have problems with the resources that your your website's sitting on so talk now to your hosting provider ask how much more traffic your website can actually handle um, talk to your web developer if there's anything you can do to optimize the website to handle more traffic and and also i would say um, marketing emails um, be very careful because if you've large lists of like, you know, 100,000 email addresses on it and that kind of thing, and you send out a marketing email uh, driving people to your website, you send it to everybody all at the same time. Um, and, you know, 10%, 15% of those people go straight away and click on the email and click into your store. And all of a sudden you have 10, 15,000 people all in one go looking at your website. It, it may not, um, you know, your website may not handle that. So when you're sending out um, emails to large lists, you can batch process the email. So you're sending out 5,000 emails every 30 minutes or something like that till it, it goes through the entire list. Um, so it, it brings the traffic a bit more steady to the website. And um, also, I suppose my talk was more about improvements that you can make to your website um, to increase conversions, but it's only really worth doing if you're getting traffic to your website. If you're an early days retailer, online retailer, like a lot of you might be right now because you've just embraced kind of going online in the last six months and you're still trying to build up your traffic, um, you can get hooked on this, um, making your website better um, and making improvements and tweaking and changing it the whole time and not spending enough time on um, what Connor and um, the other panelists talked about, which was driving traffic to your store, right? Um, so ultimately, you, you need to get a, a good a good mix of both. Um, but you should really try get a, 
a grip of, you know, where is your problem? Is it conversions or is it um, traffic? And finally, um, just a, a couple other things here. Um, Retail Excellence will have a blog post going up uh, shortly uh, with a lot of ideas and suggestions about last minute marketing for your Christmas website. Um, so I guess that will probably go out in the next members update, um, or you can just click through to their website, to their new news section, and you'll see that there. And also I have a, a 91 point checklist that goes through all of the things that you should do with your website um, to optimize it for conversions and maximize sales uh, from it. Um, if you want a copy of that, just pop me an email. Uh, my email address is on the screen and I'll happily send you a copy of that. And you can just use it and go down through the 91 things on it. It's, it's very quick. Just tick off the things that um, you, you've got on your website, um, you know, circle or mark the things that you haven't. And it'll give you a list of um, things that you can do to improve your website, to increase uh, sales and revenue. So yeah, that's it. Uh, best of luck with Christmas. That's great, Nick. Thanks for that. Uh, we might just do one quick question to each of the panelists there and uh, we'll bring each of the panelists back on there. We'll, we'll turn on your cameras. Um, so Nick, while I have you there, um, I suppose we'll go to you first. I suppose, um, is there any final tip you want to give to everyone um, that, that's listening in for the next period? Yeah, yeah I think... Um... If you're not doing online marketing right now, um, I think Facebook uh, paid ads is a good place uh, to look for traffic. It's a lot quicker to get approved on than Google AdWords because you've got to get with Google ads, you've got to get your product feed set up. Um, so I would look at doing something like that. And I would be driving that traffic towards uh, a Christmas page or Christmas section on your website with your Christmas gift products on it. Okay, great. That, that's super. And Anik, over, over to you, I suppose. Um, in terms of the main emails now people should be sending out in the build-up to Christmas, what's your, your final thoughts? And is there a preference in, in how often they should be sending them out? You know, is it better daily? Is it better twice a week? Or what's your, your thoughts? Um, I think in the build-up to Christmas now, like some essentials that I would start including, um, if you have products, you could build up a gift guide. Um getting those ready, I suppose, end of November, start of December, getting them sent out, um, obviously with everyone being online, making sure that your emails tie in with your last delivery date. Um, so I think sometimes people send promotional emails right up until Christmas, but um, unfortunately they would have needed to order their product maybe a week before, or maybe 10 days before to get it delivered in time. So just make sure that all those aspects are communicated within your emails. Um, promotional emails obviously are really important on the way up um, in the build up so kind of just I would say kind of one to two a week I wouldn't necessarily be overloading people's inbox you know with one a day because they'll just get ignored and unsubscription rate will go through the roof um, but yeah and, and I think as well just a special note like if someone is shopping Irish like a thank you message on Christmas day and just like a happy Christmas message that says thanks for supporting our business those sort of personal touches you know will go miles in this kind of climate yeah. Okay. That that that's a good one, Anik. Actually, yeah, you wouldn't you'd, you'd forget about that. All right, uh, Martin. Over to you. I suppose um, in terms of what indicators are there to let you know that SEO is working, not working. Uh, final thoughts on that? Yeah. So I guess um, like one of the most important things you can do is uh, take some content from your website and Google it as a start, because like that's mm. your first point to know that Google can actually see your website. Um, after that, then it's kind of getting more into what your competitors are doing, kind of comparing what you're ranking for and what they're ranking for. Mm. And I guess uh, the, the big tip I always give people is use Google against themselves as much as you can. Like, I know I always say that there's other search engines, but Google's the big one. Um, so like, you know, do look at the search engine results page, just the page that appears after a Google search. Mm. Um, actually do look at that, see what's on it. Like, you know, look at the people also ask boxes to see what other questions are there. Make sure your page, your pages is actually answering these other queries. Um, use Google Search Console, use Google Trends. Um, like I said, there was a time when Google was, uh, they actually put it into the terms of service where they said search engine optimization was a breach of Google's use. Um, and they actually were trying to actively discourage SEOs. And now they've kind of realized that SEOs can make the internet a better place. So um, right. they're very much kind of leaning on us to improve web, web, web experience from a user point of view. So um, do okay. look at all their documentation and all their tools and kind of use them against themselves as much as you can. Fair point. Yeah. 
And Connor and Aideen, I suppose, final thoughts from you. It, I, I presume it's not too late to reach out to influencers now, Aideen, at, at, at this time or? Yeah, no, definitely not. Like, I mean, we work all the time, so yeah. <laughs> it's too late to squeeze in an extra job here and there. Okay. I think, I think that what I would be saying as well is like, kind of planning ahead there with some of the guys who said about gift guides and stuff like that and where influencers actually could slot along some of them things and featuring products and gift guides in the lead up not just black friday but into december and obviously mm. before end of shipping dates yeah yeah no that that's fair uh that that's a good point um and then michelle over over to you final final uh, tips from from shopify uh i suppose if people are hesitant about moving if they're already on another platform not to be afraid of migrating i know it mm. sounds crazy to throw another task like that in at this time of year but yeah. some of the things that have come up there as pain points you know trying to optimize images trying to get you know a website to actually work properly for you to handle all this extra traffic if you get a media mention or you get you know an influencer does a swipe up and suddenly there's thousands of people on your website or your email list actually works properly if all of the other speakers tips work and you get a, a burst of traffic and your servers can't cope with it, like that won't happen with Shopify. Mm. So just that we, and I don't mean this to sound like a sales pitch, but just that we, we solve more problems than just, you know, it's an easy to use online store. It's also optimized to really run your business on it. Mm. Um, and then just not to be afraid to reach out for support and ask questions because everybody is, is going through a difficult year and just lean on your, other members here or the organizations and definitely Shopify support that you know nobody's in this alone I suppose because yeah we didn't think back in March that we'd still be talking about this in the run-up to Christmas I know yeah. and it's not going to magically end on the 31st of December either so just to make sure that you're not um burning the candle at both ends and and always put the hand up for help yeah that's a fair point no good one to end on Michelle and um if anyone else has more questions for anyone individually send them on to us and we'll send them on to the guys and send them back to you for, for with answers. And we'll get the video up on YouTube and we'll, we'll send it around for anyone that missed anything uh, there this evening. Um, so that, that's no problem. So thanks to all our panelists. I appreciate you uh, taking the time to join us this afternoon. It was very insightful. And um, we'll talk to you very soon. Okay. Thanks, thanks guys. Yeah.